Um, what's kind of your mindset as far as that with deal volume to deal size, I guess? Uh, so my goal for 2025 is $1 million in profit. And the way that that breaks down is me targeting um, just bigger profit deals. I like what you're doing as far as your niche. Have you hit any of those like high dollar amount subdivides? My biggest deal to date, just closed it last week, was a 95K double close. That was a $575,000 purchase. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Atke, joined today by Dylan Roosh. Dylan, really excited to have you on here. Dylan was here. Do you know when you were here last, Dylan? Yeah, I think I was in person in your guys' studio in about early April. Um, so it's good to be back and hopefully give a report to to everyone who's uh, who's been yeah. following your podcast. Yeah, so if you guys haven't watched his first one, it was, when'd you start, Dylan? I started, my first mail hit about this time last year. Um, okay. So I'm about a year in um, to actually doing this whole land investing craziness. Love it. So yeah, you're you're a year in, just like Landon, who we had on, and yeah, getting an update on yours. What where are you kind of right now in your business? Let's jump right into it. Perfect. Yeah. So I think when we met in April, when I was on the pod, um, we talked about being right around 200k in profit. Um, that probably ended up being right around 120k in profit, and that's after paying off investors, after closing costs, and and all that good stuff. A lot of that's just based on um, I think I had a deal fall through, and then maybe some deals not selling where I thought they might. Um, but now we're recording this in late October, and I, I think I'm right around 400k in revenue. Uh, 290k is realized net revenue again after paying investors and closing costs. That's nine deals all the way through at that 290K uh, realized revenue um, standpoint. And then um, at about 110 from an expected revenue standpoint, that's uh, three deals either on the market or under contract, uh, which gets me to that 400K number. Um, so really excited, a lot of progress since since the podcast and certainly looking back a year ago today, um, couldn't imagine where I, where I am now. So it's exciting. It's crazy. Let's back let's back up to when you first got started in land investing and kind of what that looked like. Um, what kind of got you into this business? Cuz I think backing up and like we can kind of t- we can obviously take it forward from there. What got you started in land investing? Like what what brought you to it? Yeah, so I was interested in, in personal finance for a while. Um, I kind of talked about that on the previous podcast and then got into real estate investing. We have a couple of Airbnbs, so that pairs really nicely with the active income that land investing provides. And as I got busier, we have two kids now, my wife and I do. We I was just looking for something that I could do remotely um, and maybe put the kids down and then go work on the land investing business. And this really fit well with my lifestyle. And uh, it's been such a huge blessing for my family and I and um, looking really looking forward to the end of this year and into 2025 um, what I and my team can accomplish so you were rental properties and like that that's the thing I always tell people because they're trying to quit their job from rental properties like it's not really possible unless you have five six million dollars cash ready to put into rental properties if you're improving them and then uh refinancing you can get cash from that obviously but talk about that a little as far as i don't think you ever went into rental properties trying to like quit your job but uh it's just an avenue to build long-term wealth yeah exactly long-term wealth long-term assets the cash flow is great especially with um short-term rental investing um and yet just almost use it as supplemental income, the rental properties piece. And then what drew me to land investing is just how you can scale, how you can do this from wherever. Um, you can close big deals, small deals from anywhere in the country, um, have a property that's closing in a couple weeks in North Carolina, um, just closed a big deal uh, last Friday that I never even visited. Um, so that just shows how you can scale within land investing that you can't do um, with true rental real estate. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a huge point of a lot of people you need a cash cow to get out of your job. And that's a lot of people's goal is to create more freedom. What does, uh, I always ask that for people is like, what, what does freedom look like for you? I know you're still working a job part-time, I believe. Um, what does what kind of freedom look like for you? I know you have family as well. Yeah. Freedom is just being able to do what you want, where you want, with who you want. And, um, it, that's it's really not about money for me. Money's just a tool and to provide that freedom. So at this point in my life, I'm looking to optimize uh, certainly time with family and, and my faith and um, even health and fitness. I'm trying to open up more time for, whereas we're, when I was uh, about, I don't know, maybe five, six months ago, I was working my corporate job and it was just tough to, to prioritize everything. Now I have much better work-life balance and able to focus on land investing, which opens up a, a ton of freedom uh, for my family and I. 
Yeah, having a family kind of changes your priorities for sure, where a lot of people who come into a program like this, just money, 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 um, or quit their job, whatever it is. Um, so that's really cool to hear. What uh, what does your business look like right now? Like you mentioned, I know you said team. Let's talk about the team that you have around uh, Dylan Roosh. Yeah, so uh, current team, honestly, is at, at this point, it's just uh, myself and then my US-based acquisitions manager. So mm. uh, she's about five hours per week, but I wanted someone to, to represent me, represent my company well, um, and just getting on the phone with leads and just being a great um, ambassador for me and my company and what I stand for. Um, I have had two VAs throughout the year and um, currently don't have a VA, which I probably, I know I need to hire one here in the future. Um, but honestly, I, I would love to find someone who's US based, maybe 15, 20 hours a week that can follow up with towns or counties or municipalities to understand different zoning regulations and code ordinances, stuff like that, and also follow up with leads as well. So um, I would love to go to the US-based approach going forward. Um, so yeah, it's just me and my sales manager currently, and I, I, really, I, I like that model, just being able to, to run a little bit more lean um, towards the end of this year. So did you go through like a formal hiring process or was someone you knew for that? I uh, found her on Upwork and okay. uh, had, a, had a number of interviews and she really impressed me. She has she had a lot of sales experience, but then uh, had to work with training her on uh, on land. So uh, put together a ton of Loom videos, uh, showed her kind of how to comp land. Honestly, mm -hmm. when the leads come in, I'm still comping and saying, hey, here's the price range we can be, it, be at. Feel free to follow up with these landowners and and see what they say. Just because I'm using utilizing cold call uh, land caller as a cold calling service, and you get 40, 50 leads per month, and that's just hard to keep up with with one person. Yeah, so she's just calling those people back. Is it like set times, or is it just like when you get leads, she's calling, them or what, what does that look like? Because I know response time. I know Landon talked about that the other day. Just uh, time to response. Like, what does that look like for her? Yeah. I, even on my end, I wanted to make it as flexible as possible for her. Um, so she usually calls in the evenings. Uh, she's an entrepreneur herself, so she has a lot going on, but uh, wanted to take on this land investing uh, acquisitions manager role for me. And she's been doing a great job. She's closed, I think, I think a, I know a couple deals she's closed and maybe one or two of those without me even having to talk to the landowner at all. Um, so that's definitely a model going forward mm. where if I could help offset some of that, and I'm still jumping on sales calls often. Um, but yeah, just as you build a team, as you build a business, it can't just rely on you. So is sales something you felt like some people hire first because they felt it was a weakness. Some people hire because it was just taking so much of their time was in sales in particular. Was that, what was the reasoning for that position? I know you hired two VAs that didn't work out. It sounds like, but as far as the sales acquisition manager, um, what, what was the reasoning? Yeah, the biggest reason was just the sheer volume of leads. So the combination of direct mail and also um, 40 to 60 leads from the land caller, the cold mm -hmm. calling service. I just needed help operationally to keep up with all of that. And again, I'm still hopping on sales calls. I don't consider myself a, a, a tremendous salesperson. I'm more so just like, hey, I'm going to treat people well and have a customer service approach um, and just have a good conversation with, mm -hmm. with folks who are potentially interested in selling. Um, so yeah, we're kind of tag teaming the, the sales aspect of all the leads that are coming in. That makes a lot of sense. I want to get into, so what you're doing differently than a lot of people, like you're going after really, really, really expensive areas um, with where five acres might sell for 200 grand, stuff like that. And you're looking for subdivides there. I want to talk through like you first, first of all, just getting started in those areas. Like what drove you towards that? And like, what does that look like? What, what looks different on those? So to break it down, got, uh, actually let you, let you break it down. Yeah, so um, I, to be honest, and uh, uh, this is this can be a pitch for Land Portal. But Land Portal has been a game changer for me in terms of targeting. Um, you, you've always been able to, to target higher acreage ranges, but targeting parcels with a lot of road frontage that's huge when it comes to subdivide plays. And um, so I've just started doing that. I've also filtered out wetlands or FEMA floodplain, which has helped out a ton. So at this point, I'm pulling all my data from Land Portal. And then still sending the direct mail, but also when I send all that data to land caller, every lead that comes in is a is a good parcel and something that I can work with. Sometimes uh, an owner may want market value, which is tough to to work with and doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. But at the very least, every lead that comes in is uh, a quality piece of land. So starting off, land portals help tremendously, and then um, it, it all kind of depends on what 
sandbox you want to play in. I'd rather play in the the sandbox that um, is an expensive area where you have a little bit more margin and wiggle room uh, for negotiation, where if you're going into areas where maybe retail is $20,000, it's hard to have much wiggle room and and offer 10K or or 12K. Um, So yeah, just going into expensive areas, because then if you can subdivide within those expensive areas, those could be your home run deals. So I know you're targeting a lot of road frontage. Are you looking for, um, are you talking to counties before and making sure you can subdivide what it was subdivide? What does that look like before you actually, when you're choosing those markets? Yeah, I kind of use, um, just my knowledge base of, of a particular area. I don't check the zoning regulations prior and maybe I could to save a little bit money, but I'm more the ready, aim, fire type of a ready fire aim type of approach in terms of let's just get the marketing out there let's see what leads come back and then as those leads trickle in i do my due diligence on the land and then dive right into the zoning regulations and some of the ordinances that are involved within a village or a city or a county what what have you seen the is it more barrier in your mind or have you not done any like have have you done any subdivides in more rural areas or as far as like is there a more more restrictions generally subdividing in those. So when you're talking about guys, when you're talking about subdividing closer to a city in an expensive area, we're not going to talk in details about where Dylan's doing deals. It doesn't matter. It's closer to a main metro area. And are, are you seeing the barrier to subdividing being more or no? Honestly, in the areas that I'm targeting, it's more advantageous to go into the areas right around the major metros because you have to look at their comprehensive land plan for 2030, 2035, and that'll tell you a lot about what you can or can't do in the future. Whereas if you get too rural, a lot of times, at least in my market, um, a lot of it's zoned agricultural, and a lot of these counties, towns are looking to keep that land zoned as ag so a lot of times you maybe you can subdivide it but you couldn't put just a residential home on that so i, I had one piece of property that was zoned as ag got under under contract at a price that makes sense no matter um, what i'm able to do with it and i went to the town plan commission went in person kind of pitched uh, my csm and my survey uh, proposals and that got shot down because they wanted to preserve it as farmland so um, i'd almost prefer to work right around the major metros and, and around cities just because it's more advantageous and the zoning ordinances allow you to, to do a little bit more from a subdivide standpoint. And that's the thing when you're going after whatever, three, four, five hundred thousand dollar profit deals, which a lot of your deals you're going after are like that. You don't need a deal every month even. Like you get a deal, is that like your mindset going forward as far as like, let's just do four deals a year, 300, 400,000 a pop, and then uh, it's a good little life. Um, what's <laughs> kind of your mindset as far as that with deal volume to deal size, I guess? Yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about my 2025 goals for my land investing Let's business. Let's talk about that, and, yeah. Yeah, so um, kind of built out a, a spreadsheet. And honestly, uh, so my goal for 2025 is $1 million in profit. And the way that that breaks down is me targeting um, just bigger profit deals, which yes, it'll require more work from a, a zoning and subdivide and, and all that standpoint. Um, but I kind of have the idea where it might take two to four deals to get halfway there to that million dollar mark. So um, I kind of have it broken down. I think there's probably one deal a year that anyone who's doing consistent marketing can get. And I have that at 250 K and then I have it based on small, medium and large deals. So I have it broken down as one monster deal at 250 K plus, and then large deals, probably two or three of those at 125 K plus. So if you get, two to four of those deals, you're already at that 500K mark. And then we'll do those traditional flips all the time in those small to medium um, size range that are maybe 15 to 50K in profit. Um, So I kind of have it all broken down um, in this fancy spreadsheet. So to get to that million dollar mark, it's probably gonna be roughly 15 to 20 deals, uh, more so lopsided on that uh, larger profit deals, if that makes sense. That's really cool. if I, if I, if you come on the pos- podcast 12, 13 months from now, November, early December of uh, 2025, and you're like, the, the year was perfect. Um, like everything, or I blew through my goals. Like, what, is, what does that look like as far as, I know you said your size of deal, and it's hard to really predict the size of deals, but I, I think you can blow past the million dollars of profit, Dylan, and 20, doing bigger deals. Like they add up really, really fast as you're starting to realize. Um, but yeah, you come, you come on. December of 2025 and you're 
just pumped about what happened in 2025? What does that look like? Yeah, it, it'll continue to be a lot of education in terms of like, how do I structure entitlements? How do I do subdivides? There's so much that goes into it in terms of like wetland delineation studies and what the county will let you do from a road frontage standpoint. And that's what I learned in a, in a big deal that I just uh, closed on as a double close about a week ago. Um, so yeah, those monster deals are out there. It's just a matter of gearing your marketing towards those large large to monster deals. Uh, and that's what I've started doing. So my marketing has changed since I started off in this business, just doing um, a blind offer price. I'm still doing blind offer, but I'm targeting my marketing and my messaging based on, hey, we're interested in your lot. If it's a prime development opportunity, we want X amount of road frontage. We want X amount of acres. If your lot fits this, we're interested, here's the price, and then you negotiate from there. So a lot of times when I get calls back from leads, most times I'm the highest direct mail offer that they've ever seen. And usually I've been pricing maybe 70 to 80% of market value, which I'm fine with if I can provide those value add opportunities with development and subdividing. Um, so that makes me feel better too about really playing close to market value, make it a win-win for everyone involved. And then me doing the legwork um, on the development side um, to drive bigger profits. That's awesome. Yeah, I think it's crazy. Like everyone I talk to who's really successful in this business, like they do things how we teach them and then they just make little tweaks, adjustments. You have a really, really good, I, I like what you're doing as far as your niche um, and the markets you're in. I think it's, I think you don't need to do a lot of deals to make a ton of money, which I know you're, uh, I, I know that's what, like what you're doing. Have you hit any of those like high dollar amount subdivides? I thought you told Dan one, but did it follow through or like, what does that look like? Yeah, so I'm getting a ton of leads. I've ran into some roadblocks in terms of um, the plan commission in a given municipality or just different zoning ordinances or timing with the seller. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest deal to date, um, just closed it last week, was a 95K double close. Um, that was a $575,000 purchase. Um, and honestly, that could have been my monster deal. Um, kind of got backed into uh, a deadline crunch that would have taken probably the 575k purchase, but also roads aren't cheap, which I found out very quickly. Uh, so between civil engineering, I estimated that to be about 80k, and then a road probably 500 to 600k. So you'd be all in for 1.2. And honestly, in that area that I was in, I could have made it eight to 10 different lots at probably 200k a piece. Uh, so that could have been my monster deal right there. Um, I just based on timing and, and whatnot, and kind of it would have needed a rezoning as well. So I decided to go with the double close, get that just short, just shy of six figure deal. And then um, going forward, I learned so much from that experience where next time where a lead like that comes up, I'll be able to take it down myself, use partners to raise capital, and then see a lot of the upside that this developer that I double close to will be able to see on the back end. Yeah, I remember getting uh, quotes on a road once. Uh, like a legit road, like, and they are not cheap. Uh, I don't know how long yours was. I remember getting quoted 800,000 or something like that. And I'm like, holy moly. And then there's all these regulations, fire department stuff. They need to be able to turn around at a cold, like you need to make sure all these other regulations. And it's like, that's just, it's definitely an opportunity for sure. But you mentioned uh, putting together capital and stuff. And when you're going after bigger deals, having money partners, having people, that can provide a million dollars for a deal and get a return in whatever 12 months, whatever that looks like. How is that, uh, how, how is that coming along? Do you have enough access to capital as far as that? Or are you kind of, is that a constant thing you're working on? Yeah, it's, it's a constant thing I'm working on. Um, continually trying to, to post about what I'm doing on Instagram just to get people interested, whether it's uh, people I already know within my inner circle or people within some of the mastermind groups that I'm part of. I would say it's about 50-50 right now in terms of deals that I've funded myself versus uh, bringing on capital partners. And I have, a at this point, uh, about a year in, I have a lot of success stories in terms of what I've been able to produce for those capital partners. Um, most of those deals have turned around in less than three months. So um, these capital partners are making, I don't know, 15 to 20% on their money within two or three months. Whereas you, if you break that down annually, that's a huge win for them. Um, so I'm gonna continue to, to build my portfolio of those successful deals and be able to continue to um, highlight that to potential investors. And I've even uh, floated around the idea of putting, to, put, 
putting together a fund, whereas instead of um, giving up 30% on a profit split for every single deal, if someone else funds it, maybe you can put together a fund and do a preferred return for 18 to 20% on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. There's so many people who have capital that are looking to get it outside of uh, Wall Street and the stock market and would invest in something like this, and they would gladly take 18 to 20% preferred return. So um, I just know that if I could get five investors at 50k a pop that would work wonders for my business and i even used ai to help me calculate what that would look like based on my 2024 numbers and if i had a fund at 18 to 20 percent preferred return versus uh 30 profit split for every deal i would have saved probably 75k on my bottom hmm. line um so th the access to the capital and cheaper money is huge for a land investor yeah i agree like it's a uh, and it's a gap for people just some people don't put effort into finding those people or solving those things. It's not a, it's not the same for everyone. It's not the same for Dylan. It's not, the, it's not the same for my business. Um, everyone has different kind of funding needs and stuff like that. You need to put time and effort to do bigger deals. You need access to capital. And so many people are looking for deals and they get the deal and then they just message a few people and they don't actually know how to get the money. You mentioned here, um, Dylan, that AI is a big part of the future of your business. Talk about that. Talk about what you've the value you've seen in it thus far, saving time, saving money, everything like that. Yeah, so I'm certainly not an expert in AI. Um, I have paid for some courses that I'm about halfway through on that'll help me understand AI a little bit better. And um, even a few weeks ago, I thought AI was just chat GPT, but yeah. it's so much more than that. Um, I've used it to help with uh, understanding zoning ordinances where you just download the zoning ordinance for a municipality, you plug that into either chat GPT or Claude.ai is what I've been using recently. Mm. And that helps you understand what you can or can't do. Um, it's helped me with sales scripts. Even earlier today, I, I plugged in um, some transcripts from my Loom videos, plug those into chat GPT, and that built out SOPs for my team based on the Loom video that I already created. Um, so there's just so much that you can do within AI. Um, I know you can even use it to like put together pitch decks for local developers and builders in the area if you do get something under contract. So it'll also allow land investors to run, run a little bit more lean um, in the future because you can use AI for a lot of things that you would normally outsource to a US-based or a, a traditional foreign-based VA. That's really cool. And I, I know everyone, I think, like even the people who use AI all the time, I think they understand that they underutilize it. It's definitely something that I'm trying to work on. It's just the learning curve, I guess, is not that I don't use ChatGPT, I do, but as far as like, I know how much time it can save if you put some money into learn or put some time, not necessarily money, into learning it. What was that other one you said it was called? Not ChatGPT? Yeah, it's a uh, Claude, C L A U D E dot A I. And that, I think it just helps think a little bit more and just has more personality to it than chat GPT does. Again, I'm still learning, but I've really enjoyed it and have learned a lot from it. Um, a little bit more flexible than chat GPT and you kind of use both simultaneously for a lot of what you do. I think we kind of skipped over, not skipped over. I know you mentioned it, that double close where you bought for 575 and made $95,000. Cause that's not a, that's a big deal as far as like making 95 grand without any money out of your pocket. Not necessarily but just like, How'd you sell that property? That's what I'm kind of curious about. How'd you get it under contract? What did that look like? Did you have a cash offer price that they didn't accept? What, what, talk about that whole deal. Yeah, so uh, got it under contract. Well, the lead came in through direct mail um, and had a verbal agreement on actually a lower price and the seller decided not to go with that. Um, I was pretty disappointed for about 24 hours, but then I was like, screw it. I'm going to send an updated offer, which was more than six figures more than what we had previously talked about wow. and it came back and was accepted and at that point it was game on and i gave myself about two months to kind of uh for the closing date and i really needed every single day of those two months because then i, I looked into developing it myself understanding what those costs might be calling the the village and the county dot to understand where i could get road access um there was also wetlands involved kind of in a corner of the property, mm -hmm. um, which didn't scare me. But as you get into these development deals, there's even something called a wetland delineation study, which Ron, I know you know, um, and I, I kind of knew of it a few weeks ago or a few months ago, um, but that can really impact what you can do from a road and a building standpoint. Um, so there was just so much that was going on with that property that I was just like, I'm just gonna look to uh, double close this to a developer. Um, and I 
honestly learned a ton on working with developers as well. Um, these guys are busy. Uh, the guy I double close to, um, he's one of the biggest developers and builders in, um, in my area. So really just, I probably had 15 to 20 conversations with him um, and just tried to present my deal thoroughly and uh, professionally and gain his respect. And one piece of advice I'd give to anyone who's working with a developer is you need to leave a lot of meat on the bone for their deal on the back end. If you try to go maybe 1.5x of what market value is, they're going to kind of blow you off. So um, I kept my estimates on what I was looking for the property, very conservative. And that kind of gained respect and uh, allowed me to ha continue that conversation and make something work eventually. So, um, so yeah, a lot of fireworks towards the last two weeks of that deal. Had to bring a hard money lender in last minute based on a, a, a few timing things, um, but it all worked out and uh, a great success story. And going into 2025, I'm gonna look to do more double, double closes as well. I think double, and I talked about the land, and I think yes, or they when we recorded is I think double closing does not get enough attention as far as just what you did there, making ninety five thousand dollars without any money out of your pocket, without any real risk. To be honest, like you probably could have extended the contract a month or I don't know, but you probably could have extended the contract a month or two if really need be. But you did the work, and the seller's happy. Like that seller's not mad that they got five hundred seventy five thousand dollars. Like that's what they agreed to, and for that much money, like two months that's no time honestly how long was it when you got under contract with the seller till you decided like yeah i'm not going to develop this myself it was probably maybe two months prior to, uh, maybe a month prior to the closing date um just with all the costs that were involved i was quoted four hundred dollars per linear foot which would have been at least 400k from a road cost so it's like i could i even looked into working with a commercial lender. So I would have had to come up with probably 200K at a down payment and raise the capital for that, raise the capital for a road. So it got to a certain point where I'm just like, and, and plus there's risk involved with doing it yourself. You never know what the economy is going to do. And then when you have a family yourself, it's just like, man, if something goes wrong, that would uh, not be not be pretty. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of upside, but there's risk involved too. So um, that's where the double close come in and can mitigate your risk quite a bit. Yeah, I think your first deal doing something like that, like it has to be just more of a home run than that, to be 100% honest. Like there's just things come up that could have ended up costing, like you could end up breaking even, like you have no, you just don't know with something. There's so much unknown. Something comes up with the wetland study or maybe the wetlands, but who knows? And then you all of a sudden have to pay some crazy amount of money or the deal falls through. You can't split it up as much as you think. Like there was a lot of risk. I think you did the right thing based on everything you're telling me there. Um, you talked about hiring. Can you talk about those two VAs that didn't work out for you? Was that a, a them thing, a your business thing? What, what happened there? Uh, I'd like to take the approach of just having extreme ownership. Um, honestly, I could have done a better job making more loom videos and checking in a little bit more than I did. Um, so yeah, it's VAs are tough. Um, you're in different time zones. If you find a good one, hold on to them, pay them well, and uh, treat them great. Um, and honestly, like once I saw that the ones that I did hire weren't great, weren't super motivated, I like to uh, to fire early, which I know sounds harsh, but um, sometimes you just got to make decisions and uh, cut ties with someone and then move on to the to the next employee, which again, I sound uh, harsh saying that, but in this business, you got to be proactive and, and move quickly. So do you not have right now work for a full-time VA in your mind? I think that's the hardest thing with hiring VAs is when they're part-time because then they're always looking for other jobs or they have to have another job. If you can give a VA 40 hours a week, you have the ability to have a lot of control. Not saying the people you had were good either way, but um, do you not, what, what what would be a VA be doing? Uh, probably a lot of due diligence tasks. So when leads come in, um, putting in the land ID link into my CRM, um, I'd like to find one that it would be able to converse or to comp first of all, because that would take a ton off my plate if they could do the comping. And then if they could converse with the with the town or the village or the county on different zoning regulations and whatnot. So I would say, yeah, I, I probably do have enough work for a 40 hour per week VA. And even in the last like month or two, admittedly, I haven't been super consistent with my direct mail, which I want to get back on. A lot of it was just trying to 
do that double close and that kind of took all my focus for a couple weeks there but um yeah looking to go hard from a direct mail and a cold calling standpoint where that'll be more than enough lead flow uh for a va to be full-time have you ever done any texting or are you not interested in texting great question so i did do texting for a couple months and, and the va that i hired was doing primarily texting i think he probably had four or five other jobs that he was texting for too so that was part of the problem um but yeah, I, I definitely see the value in texting. Just operationally, I didn't like it because I didn't really like going into launch control and there'd be 500 texts and there was maybe one or two leads and mm-hmm. I'm guessing it was maybe something I was doing wrong. But I love um, the cold calling service that I use because they just drop the leads right into my CRM. Um, I don't really see the conversation that they had or hear the conversation that they had. I just know the the details on the land. They plug in some notes and then me and my acquisitions manager, we follow up and uh, kind of give our pitch. So that's just automatic leads and just a consistent lead flow. Whereas I didn't have as quite consistent of leads with texting and I just didn't love it operationally, but that's just me. I know it can work. So what, what's your combination of mail and cold calling look like it are is it the same properties you're doing this stuff for is it separate what what does that look like uh a lot of times it is the the same property so i'll reuse that same da- data um maybe i direct mail it first and then follow up with or have my cold calling service follow up or vice versa um the, the nice thing i the thing that i do like about cold calling is it allows you to go into those expensive markets that are maybe a little bit tougher to price and um, those leads just pop in whether it's it could be a two acre lot right in a great metro area that you wouldn't probably get that type of lead from direct mail but you can with cold calling so um, i do kind of pick and choose what i what i do from a strategy standpoint whether it's cold calling versus direct mail Um, but a lot of times i will reuse that data and just have multiple touch points I like that a lot. What, what's your volume right now, direct mail and uh, cold calling? Yeah, so cold calling, I usually get 40 to 60 leads uh, per month, and that's great. It's it's probably about three grand per month from a cold calling standpoint. And then direct mail, I know annually for direct mail, I've, I've spent about fifty-five to $60,000 in 2024. Um, so you could probably do that math better than I can, but it's been anywhere from five to maybe 12,000 mailers per month. And I've been kind of putting the button or the pieces together for my 2024 uh, return on ad spend and direct mail and blind offers for me has still been the biggest return on ad spend for me, which is crazy. Um, And that could be because I've adjusted my marketing and my messaging in those direct mailers that I'm sending out, which I think is important. It's expensive. And I think that's what drives a lot of people away from it. But once you can, like, once you don't think about the money as much and you're just thinking about like, okay, this is, I'm going to get deals from this, especially when you're going after huge deals, the ROI is just really, really good overall. Um, yeah. Talk about what's kind of next. Like, actually let's go into like, you, you've been in this business a year ago or a year. Let's talk about your kind of advice for someone looking to get in and also touch base on like what's changed since you started. Yeah, I I would say my advice, like everyone says, is just try to be as consistent with you can from a marketing standpoint. I know people have heard that on podcasts all the time. Ron, you and Dan talk about it quite a bit, and it's it's so important. So that's probably the biggest piece. And and also just surrounding yourself with people who are doing the same thing. So I'm in uh, a couple different either Facebook groups or uh, group chats where everyone else is doing land investing. So when I get a deal under contract, they're the one of some of the first people that I text, um, or if I have a question, I can bounce ideas off of them. So that community is so important as well. So I would just say, stay consistent with your marketing and then just surround yourself with people who are doing the same thing. Um, a lot of friends and family are pretty amazed by all this land investing stuff. So I can't really bounce ideas off them. Um, they're certainly supportive and whatnot, but to be able to go to another land investor and say, Hey, what do you think of this deal? That is so valuable. Um, when you're just getting started communities what like i don't know i i love being in groups of people that are smarter than me um just be learning from different people learning from people who are different doing different things i know a lot of people are doing pay-per-click i know people uh, some people are doing ringless voicemail i love absolutely love learning 
about the different ways from you guys as well is like the different ways people are making money in this business and there's always more ways that's the thing it people view land as like such like oh that's just land there's only so much you can do like you build or you sell it um but within land like they're entitling subdividing uh there there's just so many things you can make money on i don't think a lot of people on the outside really truly understand i i don't think i'm wrong about that right you're absolutely correct. Yeah, it's it, we've said it before. It's basically a, a marketing business that just buys and sells land. And you mentioned RVMs. Like one strategy that I got from one of my group members that I talk to all the time is like, hey, once you get something under contract, skip trace all the surrounding parcels and send them an RVM. It costs next to nothing. You can say, hey, we're going to list it at X price, but we'll give it to you um, for, I don't know, 20% lower than that mm -hmm. if they're able to maybe do a double close or an assignment. So there's so many different nuances within land that you can do from a marketing standpoint that can really move the your business forward. I, I'm excited for the future, but I think it's becoming, uh, I think it's becoming more skilled. Is that what you're kind of seeing where like, you can't just throw, th not saying you can't throw things at the wall because you'll probably still find, find some deals and make things happen, but you need to be committed. Like it's, it's a business. Like for you to, you're probably not worried about three years from now being successful in land. Like you, when you have a business, it doesn't feel like that. But if you're just f worried about like flipping the next deal, 10 for 20,000 and stuff like that, it can be a little more uh, stressful. I think it can be a little less certain, uh, but the skills are what's really important. I think right now. Yet yeah, skills are, are crucial. And, and even like, as I look back at uh, my land investing business a year ago, I'm sure there's leads that I passed up on that I could have made a significant amount of money on. And as I learn more from a, a zoning ordinance standpoint or like a development standpoint, um, that's those are just skills that I didn't have a year ago. So now I, I just see deals within land ID or within land portal just much differently. Um, and I'm able to to be more creative with a lot of the deals and the leads that come through. hundred I, I think the creativity and like maximize there's times when you're maximizing your ROI and everything like that, you want to think about risk as well. And I think that's what you took really well. in that double close is like, yeah, you looked at like, okay, I can maybe make four or $500,000 after, but that's your best case scenario after paying an investor, everything like that. Worst case scenario was not, I, I'm telling you the worst case scenario, you could have lost money. You could have been underwater. Uh, just I, we're building a pond right now. As if you've watched any of those, like we're building a pond. And I, when you join this, call i was talking to daniel he's like yeah we need to bring in some dirt and like our price is going up 30 per like it's it, our original quote was 52 i think we're up to 75 that's 50 percent <laughs> almost um going up so like and, and a project like that you're building a road every foot is 400 dollars. like something is wrong with the you know what i mean like it, you have to move the road and change the direction like i'm telling you you made the right the risk versus reward is something you really need to balance on this business and i think also like when you're doing deal funding how much hard money you have out is risk. Trust me. I know like when I look at our numbers, like I know profit splits things, which are very little risk, no real risk on us versus when, when you have hard money out, um, it's not guaranteed that you're going to be able to pay it off or that if that property doesn't sell, like you could be in a really weird position. Totally. Yeah. And I've used hard money sparingly and uh, I've built a good relationship with the, the hard money lender here locally. And he, he helped me out with that double close and I have another deal out with him. Um, and I definitely wouldn't go to the hard money lender with a deal that carries risk, um, as as you know, and I know. Um, so yeah, profit split makes sense there. And, and even like, maybe it's not risk, but taking those singles and doubles as they come across and not trying to swing for the home run every single time, maybe when you list something on the market, I think is important too. Like I would gladly take a, a deal closing within a month at 80% of market value on the sales side, than trying to hold out for another 15% and maybe it'd taken five, six months. So just, I, I think of risk in terms of like velocity of capital as well, when it comes to the land business. Yeah, absolutely. And 95 grand isn't a bad, like that's 95 grand is 50% over the average yearly income for probably United States. I don't know what it is right now. I wish it would have been a hundred thousand though. So our YouTube thumbnail could have been six <laughs> figures or something like that. I know. Um, but Dylan, no, I appreciate you coming on here. Like I said, we'll follow up here in a year or so, see where you're going. I, I know you're going to blow through those 2025 goals. Um, if you guys are watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button below, like the video. If you're watching on Apple or Spotify, listening on Apple or Spotify, leave us a review, share this with a friend, put it on your Instagram story, TikTok story, everything like that. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. As always, thank you for joining. Please do us a huge favor and like and subscribe our YouTube channel and share this with a friend. It really means the world to Ron and I, but more importantly, it could help change the life of someone else.
Thanks for joining and we'll see you next episode.